Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning to everybody who's joining us online. I'm glad you guys could be here today. So the Miracle on Ice it was one of the greatest sports moments in recent history. In fact, uh, Sports Illustrated even called it the number one sporting moment of the century. If you're not familiar, it's the, the reference to the 1980 Olympic men's hockey team. It was a group of no-name college students from Minnesota, plus a few extras tacked on, who dared to challenge the Soviet Union, the undisputed champion, and maybe even one of the greatest, if not the greatest, team in the history of the game of hockey. And against all hope, they won. Go figure. It really was an incredible moment, and part of it was the, the challenge itself, but also the atmosphere, the context in which it took place. It was a time when frustrations and the Cold War had kind of drained enthusiasm in the nation, and we really needed a shot in the arm of, of patriotism and pride, something to be excited about, and that victory was just what the doctor ordered. In fact, it was such an inspirational moment, it was such a big deal that a lot of people oftentimes forget it wasn't even the gold medal round. It was actually the semifinal. The U.S. still had to go on and play another game against Finland, and while that game was exciting in its own right, it was comparatively easy compared to what they just done against the Soviet Union. They did end up winning the gold medal, by the way. But that's the way it goes with sports sometimes. The championship game, the home stretch, isn't always the most difficult part of the journey. Sometimes it's the obstacles that you face just before the home stretch. That's the real challenge. That's where the hard work takes place. And we even have an expression that we use all the time, if you want to think of it in terms of a, a race, it's all downhill from here. We use that all the time. Meaning what remains, this home stretch, is comparatively easy, you know, based on, on what we just overcame. There was an obstacle beforehand that was much more difficult. That's where the hard work was. The rest, well, we can do that, right? And that sentiment is kind of what our passage revolves around this morning. The hard work is already done. What remains is comparatively easy. If you have your Bible this morning, I want to encourage you and invite you to open up to the book of Romans in the New Testament. Romans, we're going to be in chapter 5 this morning. If you don't have a Bible with you, as always, we put our passage on the screen behind for you to follow along. Or you may be better served downloading the FCC Monmouth app to your mobile device. You can tap the Sunday button in the bottom right-hand corner, and that'll pull up the Sermon Notes tool, where our passages, along with uh, our outline, is there for you to take notes and to engage with the way that you get the most out of today. Now, today's message is a conclusion to a, a series we've been in for about four weeks now called Blessed Assurance. And in this series, we've been talking about the promises and the hopes that we have because of the gospel. These are promises and assurances that God gives us, not just for someday in the future when we get to heaven, hallelujah, but like stuff that makes a big difference right now, today, in the thick of life. And today our passage is going to start to pull together everything we've spoken about over the last several weeks, and it's going to present why these assurances matter so much through this idea of the hard work is already accomplished. It's going to start off by talking about salvation, and that's where we're going to start our conversation too. The hard work of salvation is already done. What remains is comparatively easy. Or if you wanted to sum it up, we could say that our fate is secure. There's a security and a confidence that we can have because of what Jesus has done. And that's what our passage starts to emphasize in verse 9, if you want to turn your attention there. It says, Since we have now been justified by His blood... How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? So it starts off talking about justification, the work that Jesus has done. And we've unpacked what that concept means a little more fully in week one of this series. If you want that fuller explanation, you can go back in the podcast and give that a listen. But for the sake of our time together this morning, the short of it is this. Justification is the process by which we are made innocent. It's where our sin is atoned for, our debt is paid, our slate is erased and made clean. In the context of Jesus and the crucifixion, he's the one who atones for our sin. He's the one that pays the debt. He's the one that wipes the slate clean. And it happened, as our passage said, through the shedding of his blood. This was a monumental accomplishment. Like this, this was a ton of work that went into justifying us and making us innocent people. 
Sometimes we overlook just the, the huge, vast scope of what it took to get us to this point. It's not even confined to the gospel story itself. We actually have to step back and take a, a wide-angle view at the entire story being told in the Bible. If we were to go back to the earliest pages of the Old Testament, we would find the seeds that God was planting and the building blocks he was establishing that would help humanity understand the significance of Jesus and what he was doing. We would find him working through individuals, and we would find him working through kingdoms, sometimes willingly, sometimes they were a little stubborn and they needed some prodding. But in his sovereignty, God worked through thousands of years to move the wheels of history forward to set the stage so that this justification could happen. And that in itself is a huge, huge work that was accomplished, but that's really just part one. Because then we have to look at Jesus as a sacrifice, becoming that sacrifice that could justify us. He had to live life without sin, even though he was tempted in every way just like us. He had to overcome those temptations and succeed where we had failed. And that, again, is an incredible accomplishment. If he had sinned, if he had been nothing more than a mortal person like you and I, well, then he wouldn't really have had a whole lot of innocence to offer us. If you want to think about it in terms of an organ transplant, we'll say just for sake of argument, your lungs, you needed a lung transplant. You would assume that the lungs being brought out to be given to you would be healthy, would be functional, would be superior to your own. But if out of those doors came some lungs that were covered in black and brown spots and filled with tar, you probably would be a little apprehensive. Hopefully you're under anesthesia so you wouldn't notice, but you would probably be a little apprehensive. Because those lungs aren't going to do you a lot of good. They're not a whole lot better than what you already have. And that's what would have happened if Jesus had succumbed to temptation and sin just like you and I. He wouldn't have innocence to offer us. He wouldn't have righteousness to bestow upon us. He really wouldn't be that different than you and me. So he had to overcome and had to walk sinlessly in this world. A monumental accomplishment. Hard work accomplished. And then there was the sacrifice itself. As our passage said, he justified us through his blood. He was crucified. And we won't go into all the gory details of crucifixion. Suffice it to say, it is one of the most despicable things that mankind has ever had the misfortune of creating. And he bore that. And he died so that we could live. All of this so that we could be made innocent. That's the hard work taking guilty people who have sinned against the Lord and creating righteousness in them through that sacrifice. But even that wasn't the finale of God's plan. Now that's something that's coming down the road when all mankind stands before Him and we are judged. And for some that may be a terrifying thought, but for those who have been justified, it's a day to welcome. Because all that remains is to hear the judge say, innocent, well done, thy good and faithful servant. And here's what our passage is saying. If Jesus has already done the hard work of turning guilty people into innocent people, well, how comparatively simple will it be to maintain that innocence? Surely He is capable of bringing us the rest of the way in the journey. If He did all of that, well, this is comparatively simple. There's this, this idea at play here, this legal matter. And, and I'll admit, as I read this verse, it was a little confusing to me, the argument is being made. But as I I started reading other people and their explanations. It, it, this legal perspective kind of helped me understand, so I'll just share it with you. It's pretty simple or pretty straightforward to prove the innocence of an innocent person, right? Like that seems pretty straightforward. That's kind of simple. It's far more difficult to, to get an innocent verdict from somebody who is obviously guilty. I actually had this experience in my own life a few months ago. I got this letter in the mail from the city of De Plains, Illinois. And inside was this lovely traffic ticket for a red light violation. Uh, apparently, at 2.40 a.m. on a Tuesday, a car with a license plate that, that was registered to our minivan uh, turned uh, illegally and, you know, got a, got a ticket. Now, I'm 35. I've got two kids. I've got a job. I can't tell you the last time I saw 2.40 a.m. willingly, especially on a Tuesday. So this obviously was not me, Right. But the license plate was kind of smudged and similar enough. So I had to prove my innocence. And it was a relatively straightforward process. You know, the, the car that was pictured in the video camera, it was some, like a Dodge Charger or Challenger, like a sporty little car. This was a minivan that it was uh, supposedly running the red light. So I took a picture of the profile, 
compared it to this car, said this is obviously not the same vehicle. Took a picture of the registration. It's registered as a, a fifth door vehicle. Obviously, this car does not have a fifth door. The brake light profile is very different on our van than it is on the sporty little Dodge. Just showing some pictures, cleared the slate, innocent verdict, don't worry about it. It was pretty simple to prove our innocence because we were, in fact, innocent. But if it really had been my van in that picture, and I really had been driving, proving some sort of false innocence would be a far more complicated and difficult ordeal because I'd been caught red-handed. And the argument being made in our passage, Jesus has already changed guilty people into innocent people. How much more simply is it to maintain innocence? To go before the judge and say, hey, remember the scars. Remember the work that's been done. Not guilty. This is the argument that's being made in our passage. We have this fate, this future that is as good as ours so long as we persist in Christ. Our fate is secure. And there's so much hope that stems from that. Not just a hope that's for someday down the road when we stand before God, but there's an encouragement today that we can enjoy because we know our fate is secure. For instance, we have this knowledge and this assurance that we're not somehow going to out the grace of God. I may stumble, I may falter, I may fail, it may be accidental, it may be willingly. I may go through a season in my life where maybe I backslide a little bit. Where maybe I have some doubts or some questions. Maybe I'm not the most faithful person. And I may really stew over that. Will God take me back? Will he forgive me? Is his grace enough to cover even my sins in my past? Or have I run out? Have I used up the grace that was afforded to me? The assurance of our passage is no. The hard work, that's already done. You've already been justified. You've already been made innocent in God's eyes. Jesus is more than capable of sustaining that innocent verdict. So long as you turn to him. And there's a peace that comes from that. And a confidence that comes from that. There's more assurance, you know. If hardship should encroach upon our lives. If difficulty and suffering should fill our days. If we get that bad news phone call from the doctor or somebody that we love and we care about is facing a potentially life-threatening situation, it would be human nature to stew and to dread and be filled with fear and consternation. But there's this assurance that speaks a real and lasting hope to us in this message that our fate is secure. I don't know about you, but when I get bad news or, or when I'm about to face a difficult scenario, even if it's hypothetical, I start running through scenarios in my head. And usually the first one I play through is the worst case scenario. If this train goes completely off the rails, if everything hits the fan and it all falls apart, what is the worst thing that could happen? Because if I can understand that and mitigate that risk, I feel a little more secure. And for many of us, the absolute worst thing we could imagine that could happen is, well, I could die. Like, that'd be a pretty bad day, right? But there's this assurance That's no longer the worst thing that could happen. Oh no, I went and stood before God and heard those words, well done, thy good and faithful servant, welcome home, and I enjoyed eternity in his presence forever. Darn. That doesn't sound too bad. And there's a hope for tomorrow, knowing that our, our fate is secure, that affords us comfort even today. Come what may, whatever storm may encroach upon my life, I know how the story ends. And so long as that ending is secure, we can make it through this, right? There's some confidence for the here and now that comes from knowing our fate is secure. But that's not even the full extent of this. Our passage in this one verse, it talks about our our future being secure. We also have this assurance that our relationship with God is secure. That's the thing with sin. It doesn't just change our legal standing, if you will, before God. It also affects our relationship with Him. Sin is rebellion, it's, it's rejection, it puts us in an adversarial relationship with our God. Our passage sums it up like this, verse 10, he says, For if while we were God's enemies, that kind of hits the nail on the head, for if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Here's one of the other good parts of the gospel and the assurance that we have for today. We were in this adversarial conflict with God. We had rebelled and rejected through sin. And yet Jesus steps in and through his work, he reconciles us. 
He changes the nature of our relationship. So it's not just a legal standing before him. Now we've been changed from this, I, I, this position of adversary to friend. And let me say, when I say that we are a friend of God, don't confuse that with some sort of childhood friendship that you experience on the playground. To be a friend of God is to be in His good graces. It is to be the recipient of His affections and His love. It is to be included among the people He holds dearest. It means that God is for you and not against you any longer. It is a wonderful thing. And this reconciliation, this coming back together, happens through the work of Jesus. And that was not an easy accomplishment. If you've ever been at odds with somebody before, you know just how difficult reconciliation can be at times. Many times because of our own stubbornness or pride or whatever. And I witnessed this in, in my own family. My grandmother, on her side, she, she had many siblings and something happened and there was a falling out. Nobody really remembers what the story even was. But for decades, they didn't speak to each other. Like, for the better part of my life, there were relatives we didn't talk about, we didn't see, we didn't mention. We had no idea what was going on in that side of the family. All because something happened. And this reconciliation, it really didn't start to get going until my grandfather passed away. And one of my grandma's brothers came to the visitation, and for the first time in years, they spoke. And that kind of got the ball rolling, but it wasn't like they were best friends after that. Because there's a lot of difficulty, a lot that has to be overcome for reconciliation to take place. Like we said, some pride has to be overcome. There's hurt that has to be overcome. There's offense that has to be addressed and dealt with. There's all kinds of things that complicate this relationship. And slowly over the next several years, she and her brother, they started to, to talk and to work through all of this. And sadly, it didn't really come to a resolution until she was diagnosed with cancer. That accelerated things. She passed away just a few short years later. It's a terrible story. But it illustrates the difficulty of reconciliation and why it's so hard to come back together with those whom we are at odds with. It's a tremendous effort. But Jesus has already done that. All of that hard work is done. And if he can do that, all that remains is comparatively easy. As our passage says, if he's reconciled us while we were enemies, how much more will we, he save us from, or will we reconcile us now that we're God's friends? Or that we are, uh, let me just read it. I'm, I'm confused. Sometimes stuff jumbles around in my mind. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through his death, uh, death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life. It's that idea that the hard work of reconciliation is done. What remains today is comparatively simple. Sometimes we forget that Jesus is still working on our behalf today. It's not like his work stopped after the crucifixion. He was raised back to life. He ascended to heaven. But even when he got up there, it's not like he kicked up his feet and started drinking umbrella drinks for all eternity. He still works for his people. In the book of Hebrews, the author describes this as the work of a high priest. He is our, our advocate, our intercessor between us and God. He continues to make and maintain that peace with the Father. In chapter 7 of Hebrews, that work is described like this. In verse 24, it says, But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. And therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him. Because he always lives to intercede for them. Meaning those whom he has established peace with God for. He continues to maintain that. He tends to that relationship. In some ways, it's kind of like teaching a, a little kid to ride a bike without training wheels. You know, at first, you, you get them on that bike and you're holding on to the seat. You're steadying them and you're like the only thing that keeps them from falling over and bloodying their knee. And you run with them while you hold it, right? But eventually... They kind of get the hang of it, you let go, and they start to pedal. But it's not like you just sort of fold your hands and go, ah, I hope he doesn't fall and break his arm, right? You run behind them a little bit, just in case they should fall or wobble, so you can catch them and keep them upright. 
And that's essentially the work of Jesus today. He got us upright on the bike. He got us moving, and he's going to keep us on that bike. We're not going to fall off and skin our knee. Or to put it more directly, he reconciled us to God. He fixed that relationship, and he's not just going to sit back and fold his hands and say, I hope you don't screw it up again. He continues to run behind his people to catch them if they should falter or wobble or fail, to write them up and to make sure that relationship stays solid and in good graces. There's security. Our relationship with God is secure. And again, that's not just a promise for someday down the road. There's hope and encouragement and confidence we can experience today because of that promise. For those of us who are are faithful and fervent and are firm believers of the Lord, this is especially important because we are not always going to be faithful and fervent followers of the Lord. There are times and seasons in everybody's life where we waver or we stumble, or we backslide. Or maybe for whatever reason, there's some attitude that creeps into our minds and starts to take root, or some ungodly uh, feeling or, or, or opinion that just takes root in our hearts that is not in alignment with God's will. These things happen because we're people that wrestle with the flesh and try to walk in the Spirit. And in those seasons, there's this certainty, this security, that hey, even though you may stumble and go through a rough patch or a valley, God's not going to abandon you. It's not like you've fallen out of his favor or fallen out of his graces. This relationship is secure. Jesus has done the hard work of making enemies into friends. He's more than capable of maintaining that friendship, come what may. And there's a certainty here that we can have. We're always welcome to come back home. There's another encouragement. Sometimes as we're trying to follow the Lord, we're trying to live out this faith in a very complicated world that only seems to be getting more complicated. We might try to get everything right and really worry that we might get something wrong. And maybe that's an opinion or a viewpoint we have on a a gray matter. Or that might be uh, the best way to approach a social issue. Or to conduct myself in a particular context and situation. Scripture gives us a lot of guidance on so many things, but on so many other things, it kind of gives us some guardrails and says, hope you're faithful. And again, this this fear, this concern might grow. I don't want to get it wrong. Here's the great assurance that we have from this promise. Our relationship with God is fixed. It is secure. There's nothing we could do that could make him love us any more. There's nothing we could do that could cause him to love us any less. So long as we maintain our relationship with Jesus, our intercessor. Maybe we don't have all the right opinions. Maybe we don't have all the right answers. Maybe the way we go about conducting ourselves, maybe it is flawed at times. We have this assurance from God. Do your best to honor him in all that you do and trust that Jesus is sufficient to make up for whatever we might lack. And if we can get a hold of that in our brains, church, it's like a weight is lifted off our shoulders. There's freedom. There's peace. There's comfort. There's assurance that God really is for me and not against me. I'm not suggesting we go out and try to sin against the Lord or try to out the grace of God. That's actually Romans chapter 6. Don't do it. It's not a good idea. But there's contentment and peace to be had today because of these assurances. We called this series Blessed Assurance because all of these promises and these hopes are a blessing. These are things that when they click in our brains really do inspire confidence and assurance and a peace. And it inspires praise. There's really few other ways to respond to God's goodness other than to just worship. And that's maybe the greatest of these promises. We are assured a reason to praise. There's always something to thank God for. We hear that in the conclusion of this little section of verse 11. It says, not only is this so, meaning everything we've talked about, our salvation, our reconciliation, the security we have in God, not only is all of that so, but we also boast, which could also be translated, we rejoice, we worship God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. It's a verse that's not talking about, hey, someday down the road you should worship because all that stuff's going to be realized. It's a verse that is saying, because of what is certainly ahead, what is assured, rejoice now. 
Praise now. Worship now. Be contented and satisfied now. We know how the story ends. Whatever comes between now and then, the end is fixed and certain. We have reason to celebrate. The mystery, the tension, the drama greatly diminished when you know how the story ends. It's kind of like watching a movie the first time versus watching it the second time. Um, suspense. Suspense is not a, a context I deal well with, uh, personally. If you're watching a suspenseful film, that phrase, edge of your seat, I am literally on the edge of my seat. And I remember uh, in college, my wife and I went on a date, we watched this movie, Disturbia. It was an homage to Alfred, Hitch Alfred Hitchcock's Rear Window. Uh, now Hitchcock, obviously, master of suspense, this movie did him justice. Because by the end of the film, again, literally, I'm on the edge of my seat, and my hands are over my mouth, and I'm watching the screen, and my heart is beating because the tension is thick, and, and the stakes are so high, the suspense is at 11, right? Because I don't know what's going to happen to these characters. Are they going to live? Are they going to die? Is the murderous neighbor going to get away with everything? Somebody said, hey, thanks for spoiling that, min that video. It's like 15 years old. If you haven't seen it, it's your own fault. But the suspense, it was so high, right? It was, it was a good movie. I enjoyed it. And I enjoyed it so much that when it came out on DVD, my wife and I, we bought it, we went home, we popped it in the player, and we started to watch it. And it was still a good film, but my reaction to it was very different the second time around. The suspense was kind of gone. I wasn't on the edge of my seat. My heart wasn't pounding because I, I knew how the movie ended. I knew after the credits had rolled that both of those characters, they were going to be fine. Their fate was secure. I knew that they were going to get together and live happily ever after, that their relationship was solid. It was secure. There was nothing that was going to happen between popping the movie and the DVD player in the end that was going to change that situation. And that sort of just sort of sucks all the tension out of the room. When you know how the story ends... It's way less concerning and way less frightening and way less suspenseful. And that's what God has given us in these assurances. Jesus has already done the hard work. If he can justify us through his blood, be raised from the dead, to intercede for us on our behalf, to maintain peace with God, if he can do all that hard work, he can complete this good work that he began in us. And we will cross that finish line. And we will wear that victor's crown. And we will hear those words, well done, that good and faithful servant. There is a real hope to hold on to. So whatever happens between now and then, the tension just sort of gets sucked up. Because, I mean, I, I might come down with some debilitating disease, and that would be bad news. But I know even in the middle of suffering, God can use that for the good of those who love Him to purify us and cultivate us a Christ-like attitude that is going to cross that finish line and hear those words. That's assured to us. So there's reason to praise God even in suffering. I may enter into a time of hardship where somebody I love and care about may pass away and I will grieve and I will mourn, but I won't grieve and mourn as somebody without hope. Because there is an assurance that's been given to all of God's people that there is something beyond these days, that there is a good and glorious reward, and Jesus has secured it for us. So there's, there's still a reason to praise. I might be on top of the world. I might be in the lowest valley. Life may be going great. It may be really hard. But I have a reason to praise God either way because these assurances are solid. Our end, our fate is secure. Our relationship is secure. God's love is secure. If those things continue to hold true, well, we can face whatever comes to us today. And I hope that this message, I hope that this whole series has kind of spoken to you. If it's not something that hits you in the immediate, hold on to these words because there's going to come a day where you will need this assurance. There's a reason, when the, a reason why the Apostle Paul wrote these in the book of Romans chapter 5. It's because in his wisdom and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God made, wanted everybody to know, your fate is secure in Christ. Your hope is solid in Christ. These are things we need, especially when life gets hard and we find ourselves in the valleys. So I pray that you hold on to these assurances and that they truly, truly are a blessing to you and your life. It all comes because Jesus has done the hard work already. 
And if you are somebody who has not accepted that grace into your life, or somebody that just has questions about what does it mean to follow Jesus? How specifically has he, he purchased this stuff for us? Why is he such a big deal? I would love to have that conversation with you. I would encourage you to take that connection card out of the back of the seat in front of you. Just put your name, your phone number on there. Say, I want to talk about Jesus. That's all it takes. And we'll set up an appointment. We can have that conversation because we want you to have the blessings of this assurance in your life now and eternally. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your kindness and your compassion. There are days where we walk faithfully with you upright and righteous according to your word and there are days where we just don't because we battle the flesh because we're imperfect people there's a number of explanations but at the end of the day we just don't and so we praise you for your kindness and for the assurance that your love endures we praise you for the promise the assurance that your grace and your mercy go on and on and on that there's nothing that could snatch us out of your grasp or tear you out of our, tear us out of your family that we are your friends and your beloved because of the work of Jesus. Thank you for that hope, and I pray that it find home in each of our hearts and minds, that when we need those words, the Spirit would remind us and recall it to our attention, that we can find comfort and peace and encouragement and certainty, knowing that the hard work is done. And if he can do that, Jesus can certainly bring us across the finish line as he intended. It's in his great and wonderful name we pray these things. Amen.